Welcome to the Orlin and Cohen Orthopedic Group Lecture Series. This lecture features our sports medicine and shoulder orthopedic surgeons, Dr. Jonathan Ticker and Dr. James Pacey, as well as physical therapist Christopher Bucks discussing the first time shoulder dislocator. All right, I want to uh, thank everybody, uh, particularly um, Scott, Ray, James, Chris, and John for uh, putting this on, getting it ready to go. And I also want to thank all the participants for uh, tuning in. Hopefully this will be one of many talks uh, that we do um, within our group. Um, we will be recording, so uh, we'll have it also for posterity. So my topic um, is to lead up for uh, uh, James Pacey so that he can talk about more of the technique uh, material. Um, my disclosures on the handout or on our Academy uh, website. Melvin Post, a famous shoulder surgeon, said uh, 1978 operative treatment is indicated when the patient has had three or more dislocations in a reasonable short period of time. 25 years later, another famous shoulder surgeon, Gary Gartsman, said historians will likely view our past treatment um, as suboptimal where we typically operate on acute ligament injuries of the knee and ankle, but rarely on the shoulder. And a lot has changed in the past uh, 17 years. So the premise is there are circumstances where surgical repair is indicated following primary traumatic unidirectional anterior glenohumeral dislocation. I'll go over some clinical scenarios, some evidence, both clinical and economic. I'll go over uh, clinical practice, what is actually happening and some recommendations and talk about a couple of uh, topics. And these are just two examples of acute uh, first-time dislocators. Age has been reported early on for many uh, decades as an important risk factor, and indeed it is. Uh, youth tend to recur, uh, to, no matter which uh, study you look at, but there's many others, including let's say sports, and particularly ice hockey with a higher incidence and a higher recurrence rate. So there are several factors to consider. This is just a list of a few. Um, as we see patients and how we're going to treat them. So again, primary macro traumatic unidirectional anterior glenohumeral dislocation is the scenario. For those of you who operate in the beach chair position, this is the only one I'm giving you. So the typical tear, as you can see, is where the labrum avulses. Um, you can see the schematic as well as the uh, uh, drawing with it right over here. But there's also another variant I'll show, the Alps lesion. I'll go in more detail where it's here and belongs there. So what's the clinical evidence? We owe a lot to the military population. Um, those surgeons uh, found that uh, operating on acute first-time dislocation uh, was uh, beneficial, and that has held up uh, over the test of time. Sandy Kirkley uh, passed away, unfortunately, too early in her career. Uh, did one of many prospective studies. This was one where the redislocation was reduced with surgery and found that arthroscopic stabilization may afford a better disease-specific quality of life than taking a wait-and-see approach. But Tony found the same thing, that it's safe and effective um, and significantly reduces recurrences. And I'll go over later why that's absolutely critical. Jacobson did a little bit different. After 10 years, 72% uh, 72 72 of patients with surgery had good or excellent results. However, 75% not treated with surgery had unsatisfactory results. That's pretty compelling just alone. There is one study in the literature that shows um, and suggests that you shouldn't operate uh, early. Uh, to me, this is a mixed population. I know Ray Sachs, we spoke about this. Um, so uh, it is there, so there is some support for waiting. Uh, another study by Longo, 9% recurrence after surgery, whether open or arthroscopic. And in fact, just a lavage led to um, a uh, better rate than non-operative treatment. You got to keep in mind that with surgery, there is the potential for complications. There are systematic reviews in literature, these um, pooled studies, uh, multiple uh, reports. Uh, through the Cochrane database is one of them, that highly active young people are less likely to have an unstable shoulder when treated surgically after an acute primary dislocation. 
just over the past few months, a publication came out that with surgery, there's a lower, late, a lower rate of total recurrent stability, seven times lower, similarly a lower rate of further surgery, and a slightly higher rate of return to play, all important factors. Thus, they recommended a primary repair arthroscopically routinely in patients who participate in sports. There is one other study that also looked uh, similar with repair versus not repair, and you can significantly reduce failures and revision rates. However, when you compared immediate repair versus after a second, it wasn't that statistically different. So as with any uh, literature, it's not all in concordance. There is an economic benefit. Uh, Julie Bishop studied this. If non-operative, there's a higher than 32% recurrence rate, surgery is favored. And with surgery, if you can have a less than 32% recurrence rate, you should operate. And the studies have shown arthroscopically anywhere between um, 8 and 16%. Kroll did a Markov model, and he found that in male and female patients, less than the age of 15, as well as male patients under the age of 25, um, surgery was both cost-effective and clinically effective. So what's happening in clinical practice? A study from Canada um, almost two decades ago tracked all emergency department physician reductions, and they found that 13% of those went on to surgery. This is a different system in Canada than we have now, plus a different uh, time frame. And here's another case uh, below. From HSS, also from the early 2000s, even at that time, over a third of their patients had only one dislocation before they went to surgery, and I know that that is uh, even higher now. And talk about bone involvement, and this is something Dr. Pacey is going to also mention. Let's talk about the glenoid, the socket first. A is the normal, um, or with no bone loss. B is with a fracture. C is a topic we're not going to talk about, more of chronic with attritional bone uh, deficits. Um, a study in 2009 suggested up to 90% of cases had bone within the labral detachment when the glenoid is uh, seen in this area. So it's very common. Dickens showed similarly that after a first-time dislocation only, not after multiple dislocations like the prior study, that 52% of patients had more than 5% bone loss and 17% had a very significant bone loss. This is the bony fracture, here's the glenoid rim. So it behooves us to look at this more carefully and to avoid further occurrences, which can increase bone loss. And again, we're not gonna talk about this more chronic type case. On the humeral side, it's also a factor. These are examples of Hill Sachs lesions in a number of patients. Ozaki showed that not only do they become more prevalent with each recurrent instability, they also increase in size. So that fracture, the Hill Sachs lesion, um, gets bigger. Or in this case, this is the first dislocation. This is the second dislocation. That surface is now going to rub on the glenoid and more than likely create a scenario for uh, earlier arthritis. This is uh, the Alps lesion I mentioned earlier, the anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. This is the uh, pathology where the labrum just uh, scars down along the neck medially. These patients really don't have a chance to be, have a stable shoulder uh, without it being repaired. It should be up here on the uh, glenoid rim. So you have to carefully mobilize the tissue so that you can bring it up, translate it superiorly and laterally up onto the rim to get a nice secure repair. Hagel lesions, these are also patients that more than likely are better off treated surgically. There are some circumstances, but let's look at this case. Here's a labral detachment, and if you look down at the five o'clock position in this video, you'll see a darker area. You've got to keep your um, attention to these types of potential, and here the capsule has evulsed from the humeral neck, and we'll see an example of that from Dr. Pacey. Associated pathology, there can be slap tears. Uh, J.P. Warner showed this uh, more than 25 years ago. This is a case of a type four slap that goes into the biceps 
along with an anterior inferior labral tear, the bank card uh, tear. You can see the probe uh, there. In this particular case, I repaired it in the upper left, then went ahead and repaired the superior labral tear. And this, you can see the, uh, the video just shows the same thing. And I um, presented this uh, or published this in arthroscopy. Here he is at five months, and he never came back after that. So for my patients, however, with a bank art tear and a type two, you could argue the lower left image on the superior labrum probing it up um, has some more translation. I rarely do a slap tear in the setting of a bank art tear. I'll probe it beforehand, then I'll do the repair and probe it after, and invariably it becomes um, a more stable construct. So I try to avoid slap repairs along with bank art repairs. I mentioned this uh, uh, tangentially earlier. Uh, this is a study from Andreas Imhoff's group. Um, and he's an excellent shoulder surgeon. I've been in his OR with him. This is his cases after 13 years. And if you look, it's only patients with more than one dislocation. But our, the arthropathy presents with increased frequency of dislocation, more anchors, and an older patient. And osteoarthritis is comparable you know, regardless of the technique, even non-operative. So they concluded that if you avoid dislocations, it's more important to prevent osteoarthritis. So that would vote towards fixing them uh, after one dislocation. So what are the recommendations? Gartzman said that when a patient sustains an initial dislocation that occurs with sufficient energy that it can be classified as traumatic, surgical repair is an option. For me, I look more carefully in patients 25 years or younger that had a reduction that required. I treat male and female patients uh, similarly. We don't want to see a lot of ligamentous laxity but they want to have, if they have persistent instability, that's apprehension. That's an important factor for me. On imaging, they have a labral deter, uh, they have a labral detachment. There can be a glenoid rim fracture. If they have an obsolesion or a haggle or a very large hill sex, this increases the risk. But you also got to think about the timing in season, and we can talk about this in the question and answer. Also for the high school students, uh, if you operate on them during the school term, it can affect uh, their academic performance. And I do try to start them in preoperative uh, physical therapy. This is an article coming out in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery um, in the next few months that I was a co-author on. We pulled 100 uh, American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon uh, members uh, who are in the near circle. We presented 162 scenarios. So of this, 90% of the experts had to agree and surgery is recommended for contact athletes over the age of 14 at the end of the season with both apprehension and meaningful bone loss. Conversely, no surgery would be recommended in a non-athlete without apprehension, without a sense of instability, um, and without any bone loss. So what's the take home message? First time dislocators deserve a serious consideration for surgical repair. And we're talking about traumatic anterior glenohumeral dislocation and be it arthroscopic or an open technique, take a critical approach to these patients. One step that I like to remind, preparing for the surgery, releasing the tissue, allowing it to float back up the labrum is as important as how you repair it. So this is a patient left shoulder with the uh, uh, labrum being released so that you can again bring the tissue up onto the rim and then are able to achieve a good repair. This is what you want. This is in a quarterback. So for me, in conclusion, a primary traumatic anterior glenium dislocation in the right patient with the right pathology, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. So again, in the right patient, the right operation done at the right time with the right rehab is the right thing to do. So thank you very much. So I'm gonna focus on now the surgical management of the first time traumatic shoulder dislocator. And um, in terms of disclosures, I do receive both research support royalties and do consulting work for Arthrex. I will talk about some of their products um, in this talk as that's mostly whose products I use when I operate. I'm also a committee member uh, for AOSSM. Um, 
Instability surgery, we've been talking about this topic for a long time. This isn't anything new. I actually gave my first lecture on this as a Grand Rounds as a resident in 2005. Um, but we've really been talking about shoulder instability from 1500 years before Christ. Um, shoulder reduction techniques have improved over the years. You can see those down in the middle. Some of my favorite lithographs of old school orthopedic surgery involve hanging children from people's bodies in order to relocate their shoulders. And some of the older terminology we talked about, um, you know, the, the Aber and the um, Ambry, the traumatic versus microtraumatic versus atraumatic instability really aren't the focus of this, but are, are topics that should be touched on in the future. We really need to focus when, when talking about repairing shoulder instability is to focus on anatomy. The anatomy is key. And what we want to do is recreate the normal anatomy as much as possible. And that really focuses on the inferior glenohumeral ligament here anteriorly and the middle glenohumeral ligament for first time traumatic anterior shoulder dislocators. The posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament also comes into play for posterior dislocators. And you can see on the bottom right here where the capsular attachment is on the humeral side, and that's where we talk about that Hagel lesion. Now also remember that anytime something tears in the body, it usually stretches before it fails. So there is some tissue give before the failure point, and because of that, we wanna take that into account when we're doing a repair. So John did a great job, Dr. Ticker, talking about the pathology, anterior bank cart tears, bony bank cart tears. We were talking about a bony fragment associated with the anterior tear. Hagel lesions, which you see one down here on the bottom right. He gave a great definition and showed some great pictures of Alpsa tears. And then there are the combined tears. In dealing with high level athletes and really with football players and guys who recurrently dislocate, we see even up to 360 degree labral tears. We have to worry about capsular lesions and also don't forget about associated, associated injuries, including fractures, rotator cuff tears, or neurovascular injuries, which we see quite often in traumatic tears. So Dr. Ticker touched on bone loss. How common is bone loss? It's actually fairly rare, especially in the initial event, especially at a significant amount. Obviously, the more dislocation events, the more bone loss, and the more we have to be concerned about addressing bone loss. So technique, technology, and rehab matter when it comes to reconstructing or fixing anything. So this is a classic article from 2006 that really taught us the majority of what we need to know about arthroscopic labral repair. And in that, the key points to success that were found with this group out of France are that three anchor points are key or more. You put the anchors up on the face, not on the glenoid neck to recreate the anatomy and delay return to sport until at least four to six months post-op. So good post-op rehab and giving the shoulder time to heal are key. So how do we do? Um, you know, if you do the right thing, you use those multiple anchor points, you do extended rehabilitation. In general, people do very well. Youth is a risk factor with anything we do. The younger you are, I like to tell, especially the young male patients, parents, that they have testosterone poisoning. We have to look out for testosterone poisoning because that's a risk factor for failure in any surgery. Um, patients younger than 30, success was associated with surgery within six months of the first dislocation. So that tells us operate early. Fix these soon and they do better. Wait and they do worse. Anchor placement, again, very important. This study out of Korea showed that if anchors are positioned in the right position on the glenoid face, you recreate the labral height and you have better success. What about bone loss? Bone loss is a very important thing to worry about. As you lose humeral head bone or you lose bone on the glenoid, when you 
rotate the shoulder, you have less surface area in contact. The less surface area you have in contact, the more likely you are to dislocate. So you need to look at this and respect this and address it if need be. Now, there are multiple ways to address bone loss, and it depends on how much of the humeral head is gone, how much of the glenoid is gone. I'm going to show a technique for an engaging hill sacs lesion where there is not significant bone loss on the glenoid called a remplissage. What about contact sports? Well, in contact sports, we actually do pretty well. This was a study in the NFL that showed arthroscopic procedures do just as well as bone block augmentation as long as there's not significant bone loss. Wide receivers and defensive linemen with a history of shoulder instability have shorter playing careers, however, so something that you need to talk to these athletes about. If there was an associated slap repair, there were fewer games played, but no change in performance. And if you had a rotator cuff tear associated, it significantly decreased your career length. What if it fails? Or what if a bony procedure fails? What do you do next? Well, an orthoscopic bank cart repair can be revised to another arthroscopic bank cart repair if it was done poorly or if it was a complete re-tear. It can be revised to an open capsular shift in bank cart repair, or it can be re revised to a ladder J. A ladder J procedure is a coracoid transfer to make the glenoid bigger. A failed ladder J is a disaster. You can revise this to a free bone block, autograft or allograft, to a shoulder arthrodesis, or a shoulder or reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So the further you go down this road, the more complex things can be, and the more complex the complications can be. So my technique personally and my consideration. Preoperatively, I prefer to use an MRI, MRI arthrogram to evaluate the shoulder joint for a labral repair, or labral tear rather, in anybody with shoulder instability. This also allows me to see a haggle tear. It's very difficult to see a haggle without an arthrogram. I reserve CT for suspected bone loss or multiple recurrent dislocations to better evaluate the glenoid or the humeral head. Intraoperatively, I do an examination under anesthesia to make sure there's not multidirectional instability and a full arthroscopic evaluation. I'll then focus on mobilization of the tissues, which you'll see, and then shifting the labrum superiorly and posteriorly to retention it and use a strong construct back to the glenoid with the anchors on the face with a minimum of three anchors to recreate the native anatomy. Postoperatively, I actually start PT pretty quickly as long as they don't need a remplissage or have a haggle repair. They're in an abduction sling for four to eight weeks with a goal of return to play at four to six months, usually for a contact athlete and either a sully, a sawa, or a spa, shoulder immobilizer for play. So this video is an arthroscopic anterior bank cart repair. Here we're looking at the subscapularis, and there's our bank cart tear up front. You can see it extends slightly beyond six o'clock posteriorly, but there's no capsular tearing and no significant hill sacs lesion or rotator cuff tear in this procedure. We then switch the camera to the front to check the posterior labrum, which looks okay. We then work very diligently to mobilize the tissue. So we almost create an alpsa-type tear in order to fully mobilize the tissue and retention that anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. And you see, we mobilize this to the point that we can actually see the subscapularis muscle below, and then work with a shaver to debride the glenoid neck to make it bleed so it has a good healing surface. We then use this percutaneous technique to bring an accessory portal so we can get down nice and low for our anchor placement. We use a spinal needle to see where we're gonna go. This is a nice system that's cannulated and you get a nice low profile cannula for your second portal site. I then actually do a drill hole first technique, but I use knotless suture anchors, which have been shown to be just as effective as anchors tying knots. But I don't place my anchors first because of the knotless technique that I prefer. So I'll drill three holes for my three anchors based on the size of this particular lesion. We'll then come in with a suture passing device called the labral scorpion in order to pass a mattress stitch for our most inferior stitch. And I love this device because you can see how big of a bite 
of tissue we can get very safely and we can get past six o'clock there to get a nice big shift. And what we'll do is actually pass both strands of the suture to pass a mattress stitch construct. And I like to think of this as a sling of suture material down at the six o'clock position to really be able to shift the tissue well and retention both the posterior inferior and anterior inferior glenohumeral ligaments properly. So we'll park those sutures out our anterior cannula, and then I'll actually pass two additional sutures. We use this loop suture because it allows for a cinch construct, which really rolls up the labrum very nicely, as you'll see at the end of this video. We'll pass two of these and actually pass the suture through that loop, and it cinches down almost like a luggage tag, as you can see there. And then we'll pass one more of those. So now we have our three suture points as this cinches down. And now we'll place our anchors. So we're already set up for our first anchor because we have our sutures parked down that first cannula. This is a knotless um, peg type anchor from Orthrex called the push lock. And you can see the shift that we get there actually tension all three sutures at once while we put this first anchor in to really make sure we tension it well. And you see it cuts nice and low profile. And then we'll place the two more superior anchors. And you can see as we move up, how big that labral bumper gets and our ability to continue to shift the tissue further superiorly and further tension both the anterior, inferior, and middle glenohumeral ligaments to really make sure we have a great shift, a great repair, and terrific tension. And you'll see that nice big labral bumper and that we've really tightened up the shoulder quite well in this case. So what about the hill sax lesion? So the hill sax lesion happens when the shoulder dislocates. It's an impaction fracture to the humeral head. It's really a dent. The humeral head's kind of soft, it's spongy. So it doesn't fracture, it indents the actual ball. Um, this limits rotation prior to instability. Usually symptomatic over about three millimeters deep is what we feel. There is a concept of on-track and off-track lesions where the bigger these get, they, they fall off track and will lead to instability. Um, in patients with a suspicious lesion where there's not too much bone loss, I prefer to do an orthoscopic remplissage, um, leveraging knotless technology. It's a single stage procedure. In a revision, I would consider a remplissage versus a ladder J. In this video, I'm going to show you an, an orthoscopic remplissage here. You can see the anterior bank cart tear and then a large hill sax lesion. However, there was no significant bone loss on the glenoid side. We clean out the hill sax fracture to get a nice bleeding bed. We put a posterior portal and then perforate the rotator cuff with a spear and place a knotless anchor here. We're making a hole for the knotless anchor. We then put in a tensionable knotless anchor in the inferior position. This is a knotless swivel lock anchor. You can see spinning into place there. And those sutures are then retrieved and, and clamped. We then perforate the rotator cuff more superiorly and place a second anchor in that position. So you can see there's now two anchors in place and the sutures, we then do our repair. And this one, we had an anterior bank cart repair and a slap repair there, you can see the anchor. And now switching back to the front, what we actually do here is we pass the sutures from one anchor to another in a crisscross technique that makes a double mattress stitch. And you'll see as we tension this down, exactly how it pulls the tissue right into that hill sax lesion. And basically you're pulling the infraspinatus tendon into the tissue. Here we're passing the suture from the inferior anchor back to the superior anchor and then shuttling it through that anchor and the knotless technique. You can see we just tension it. And as it pulls it down, it starts to fill that spot, pull a little bit more, and you're able to completely obliterate the hill sax lesion. So it can't engage now 
It's almost like putting a doorstop into that Hill Sachs lesion. Additionally, it further tensions the posterior ligaments. And here you can see that mattress stitch from up in the subacromial space. So that's a Hill Sachs. Now what about a Hagel lesion? These are difficult. When I trained, we were told that Hagel lesions have to be opened. Um, with this technology, we're now able to address them, um, I think safer than ever arthroscopically. I think technique matters, I think positioning matters. The goal is to recreate the humeral side of the sling while avoiding neurovascular injury. There's a recent paper that showed in the beach chair position that the axillary nerve is at higher risk than in the lateral position. So you really want to be careful to limit collateral damage. Um, and again, using this knotless technology, we were able to do this arthroscopically through a seven o'clock portal. So again, for the, the last video here, another anterior bank cart tear. And this is in a professional athlete. And we look down the bottom and here's our Hagel lesion. So what we do is after our full exam, you see there's no Hill Sachs deformity. We take a spinal needle to localize exactly right where the lesion is. And then I can place a clear cannula through the lesion from that seven o'clock position and place that same knotless anchor that we just used for the remplissage into the footprint on the humeral side in order to repair this lesion. So we place our anchor. You can see it's screwing in right there. Now we have the same setup with sutures that we had before. We're going to pick the suture that we want to pass first and we go back to that same scorpion that we use over on the bank cart side to make sure that we just pass it through the capsule. You can see that white stripe behind me. You don't want to pass it through that white stripe. That would be bad. And then we'll shuttle the other side with a second pass. So I use a passing suture here to then be able to shuttle it back through. And again, passing a mattress stitch taking care only to be through the capsular tissue. We then shuttle the suture through the anchor to be able to tension this ligament properly. Now what we don't wanna do in this situation is tension it all the way down at this point because it'll box us out of fixing the labral tear. So we just partially tension it right here. And then we go forward and we do our labral repair so we don't box ourselves out. You can see the end of the anterior bank cart repair performed there. And now we can final tension the Hagel repair. You can see even just doing the anterior bank cart brought it up a little bit into a better position. And now by tensioning that suture, that knotless technique, it repairs the Hagel lesion right back up. So now we've been able to tension the ligaments on both sides of the joint using knotless techniques very safely. So for my conclusions, early recognition of instability with appropriate referral is paramount. You want to send these patients to somebody with sports medicine or shoulder and elbow training um, and ensure a proper workups performed. Arthroscopic anterior bank car repair is the gold standard for a first-time shoulder dislocator and can be argued for multiple-time dislocator as well. Use an adequate technique, use appropriate rehabilitation, don't push them back too fast, and you should have a good outcome. And remember, you have every revision option on the table if this fails. Don't miss a haggle tear or a capsular tear. These are setups for failure if you miss them. Um, fix it with whatever's best in your hands as a surgeon. If you need to open it, open it. If you can do it arthroscopically, do it arthroscopically. Don't forget to address bone loss. A remplissage is a great weapon for mild bone loss. Ladder jays in my repertoire are reserved for recurrent instability after a failed arthroscopic bank cart or in cases of very significant bone loss. Remember, the complications get bigger with the bigger surgeries and revisions become even bigger surgeries. So pay attention to detail, um, respect bone loss, use those three anchor fixation 
points up on the face, shift the tissues because they stretch when they tear, adequately rehab, adequately rehab, adequately rehab, brace for return to play, I think is important, especially in contact and collision athletes. And also patients need to be counseled for risks associated with return to contact sport, especially with age. So consider that ancillary bracing, manage their expectations and beware of those young kids with that testosterone poisoning. Thanks a lot. So again, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, First Time Anterior Shoulder Dislocation. And uh, my role here is really to talk about the physical therapy perspectives on rehabbing this patient population. Um, I have no financial interest in this aforementioned lecture. A little bit of background about me. Um, I graduated as a physical therapist in 2010 from Mercy College. Uh, I became board certified in orthopedics in 2015. I finished uh, my fellowship in orthopedics and uh, manual therapy in 2015 as well. So you'll probably notice during this presentation that there'll be manual therapy undertones in this conversation. Um, personally, I have a passion for rehabbing patients with spinal pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, working with CrossFit athletes, MMA fighters, and doing running gait analysis. I've been working with Orlin and Cohen since December of 2018. Um, so hopefully at the end of this, everybody will walk away with this with just a little bit of a better understanding of the difference between a traumatic versus an atraumatic sh shoulder dislocation from a rehab perspective. Um, be familiar with some of the post-operative rehab principles and milestones. We're gonna talk about some different exercises uh, hopefully, I can introduce some interesting versions of manual therapy during tonight's speech. Um, and then we're going to talk about sports and return to play. So Dr. Tigger and Dr. Pacey did a great job about talking about the intricacies of anatomy in and around the shoulder. I just wanted to touch on a few of the muscles that are involved with specific motions. Now, understanding that the shoulder is the most mobile yet least stable joint in the body. In order to generate upward rotation, we're going to require recruitment of the upper trap, the middle trap, the lower trap, basically all the traps, <laughs> and serratus anterior, and that's for this motion, just reaching upwards. Now for downward rotation, which is just as important specific to this patient population, some of the muscles that are involved are the levator scap, rhomboids, and secondary muscles would be the lat and the pec minor. Now, while the muscles are involved in generating the movement, also we have to take into consideration that there's joints that have to move as well. So the lower cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the ribs, and then the four primary joints in and around the shoulder, uh, the SC joint, the AC joint, the scapulothoracic, and the glenohumeral joint all have to have adequate mobility as well to restore proper motion. So in designing a rehab program, uh, physical therapists really should take into consideration the following seven rehab factors. Uh, one is the onset of the pathology. Uh, for tonight's talk, we're just gonna talk about traumatic versus atraumatic. Um, the degree of instability, whether it was a subluxation or a dislocation, typically a dislocation is gonna involve uh, a little bit more trauma to the patient, so it may be a little bit more challenging. Subluxations usually just come in and out and self-relocate. Uh, the frequency of the dislocation, the direction, if there's any associated conditions with the patient, such as any connective tissue disorders like Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, this can be more of a challenging patient when selecting certain exercises because they may present with a little bit more general laxity. And also it's important to identify the patient's pain pattern that's in front of you. So if the patient comes in and they have neck pain in addition to their shoulder dysfunction, it's important to rule out any cervical spine dysfunction, any forms of peripheral nerve root entrapments, and any type of thoracic mobility uh, limitations or dysfunction as well. It's also important to consider neuromuscular control throughout the given range and the patient's activity level and the selected sport that they're trying to get back to. Now the Biton scale, I, I threw the slide in just really as a reference. Um, it's a quick and easy way to identify if the patient that is in front of you, if they have general laxity, 
it's a nine point scale. I'm not gonna go through all the points, but it's a nice, quick and easy way to identify if the patient, again, has general laxity, which may make to be a little bit more of a challenging patient when you select certain exercises. So tonight we're gonna to talk about both traumatic and atraumatic anterior dislocations, and then we're gonna talk about bank cart repairs from a physical therapy perspective. So in regards to a traumatic anterior dislocation, I'm gonna to touch on three primary phases of rehab. Now these uh, phases aren't defined by a set period of time. They're more guided by the patient's symptoms and achieving the goal of each phase. So during the acute motion phase, the patient may be in the sling for up to two weeks. Um, as a physical therapist, you're gonna to wanna to avoid placing any excessive capsular stress on the healing site, which would include excessive external rotation or horizontal abduction. Some of the common exercises that we use during this phase include active assisted range of motion, isometric exercises, and rhythmic stabilization, just to try to maintain some of the integrity in and around the shoulder. Now, at the end of this phase, if the patient's able to achieve full passive range of motion, we'll progress them to uh, or we'll segue them into the intermediate phase. Now, during the intermediate phase, we're gonna start to begin some isotonic exercises, which is a fancy name of using resistance throughout the given range. Um, during this phase, it might be a good idea to emphasize both external rotation and scapular retraining. And then if you're able to achieve full, non-painful active range of motion, then at this point, we're gonna start considering some advanced strengthening training, such as strength training, uh, power training, endurance training. We might start incorporating some PNF patterns and some sports specific exercises as well. So while there's many similarities between traumatic versus atraumatic shoulder dislocations, we're gonna talk about the differences with a patient who has dislocated their shoulder without trauma, this patient may be an older patient. They may present with multi-directional instability and capsular laxity, which may also accompany with some neuro delayed neuromuscular control. Often these patients injure their shoulder via low energy injuries, such as rolling in the bed or reaching backwards. Um, and more often than not, these patients have what we call a chronic altered movement pattern. So it wouldn't be uncommon when you're in some of the later stages of rehab to see a continued shrug sign with a forward flexion or elevation of the arm. Now the goal in rehab of both of these patient populations is to enhance compression of the humeral head on the glenoid while restoring scapular thoracic motion and proprioception and the patient's awareness of this movement. In 2010, the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy published guidelines for patients who have underwent bank cart repairs. And during these guidelines, they introduced four guiding principles to the physical therapist to be aware of. Now, surgeons have different protocols for bank cart repairs. Uh, but I thought that this was important because as a general rule of thumb, these guidelines may help a physical therapist rehab their patients and get them towards their goal. So the first uh, principle includes understanding the surgical procedure. Um, the second is understanding the structures that need to be protected and the rate at which they heal. The third principle is selecting the right exercise and applying the right stress to these healing tissues. You don't wanna to do too much too soon. Uh, more often than not, your patient will demonstrate a poor tolerance to exercise, but sometimes it's hard to tell. So you really wanna make sure that you're paying attention to either the provided protocols or the patient's response to exercise. And then last but not least, but uh, is uh, paying attention to the initial period of immobilization and the rate of range of motion progression. So like I said earlier, manual therapy was gonna resurface at some point in time during today's discussion. So part of uh, my treatment philosophy is I use um, a technique called deep fascial manipulation. Uh, deep fascial manipulation was developed by a physiotherapist in Italy 
uh, Luigi Stecco over the past 50 years. Um, this system is based on the fascial system throughout the body. It's guided by movement and it follows spe uh, specific patterns. The treatment techniques often look like focused deep pressure for an extended period of time. And in this slide, I'm going through a sequence that starts in the front of the shoulder, in throughout the front of the bicep, down throughout the forearm flexors, when combined in one treatment should foster and help assist with flexion or upward rotation of someone's arm. Okay. Got a little delay in the screen here. Okay, so this slide is a great example of how to retrain or teach your, your patients how to uh, reach backwards with scapular activation. The first one is just drawing your shoulder blades back. The second version is drawing your shoulder blades back, looking to the side, and then twisting to the side. This will further recruit some of those scapular muscles while ensuring that the shoulder doesn't translate anterior during this motion. This is a very important principle because patients who have anterior shoulder dislocations, sometimes in the later phases of rehab, as they're reaching backwards, they still continue to experience this sense of apprehension in the front of their shoulder. This next slide is a great example of how to restore uh, functionally thoracic extension, which may assist in reaching overhead or upward rotation in a patient that has these deficits. So here are some examples of some fun exercises and common exercises that I like to use in practice for mid to late phase patients who have had a shoulder dislocation. Uh, first picture is a loaded dynamic stabilization. And these exercises really address, again, stabilization, neuromuscular control and endurance. You'll see the third exercise is a modified bench press. So placing a block on the center of a patient's chest as they're going through and doing a bench press on um, the down phase will help ensure that they don't go too far down and they avoid that excessive anterior translation of the humeral head. Okay, I'm having a little delay here. So in 2017, the Journal of Orthoscopic and Related Surgeries um, published a systematic review that looked at return to play criteria for, sur for patients who have undergone surgical stabilizations for their shoulder. They looked at over 5,100 studies. And it was interesting to note that over 75% uh, of this, these studies listed time greater than six months as the sole criteria for this patient population to be at reduced risk for injury. So extrapolating that just one step further, this identifies a clear need to determine specific criteria for return to play for this patient population as the research hasn't necessarily established that yet. So understanding that there's no established protocol for this patient population for return to sport and play to date. As a physical therapist, some things that we should be looking at is before the patient gets back on the field or starts doing aggressive exercise, you really wanna make sure that they have negative provocative tests such as the load and shift, um, uh, the apprehension, relocation, and the anterior draw. These tests and maneuvers should be asymptomatic. The patient should also have full pain-free uh, active range of motion. If you have access to isokinetic testing, that's also uh, useful. And um, a physical therapist should be able to functionally test the muscle endurance and the muscle power of these patients before getting them back onto field. This way they can return back with confidence. So in conclusion, what we wanna do is respect tissue healing timeframes in this patient population, avoid early capsular stress, such as horizontal abduction, external rotation, um, allow the symptoms and the milestones to guide your progressions as a physical therapist. It's always important to assess before you assume progress. And again, there's a clear need to establish a checklist for return to, spot, to sport for patients who have undergone an anterior shoulder dislocation. Okay, 
thank you for your time, everybody. This was a blast. Thank you for watching our lectures. Please feel free to visit our website at orlincohen.com for further information about our practice and future continuing education opportunities.